Hello, everyone. Welcome to the STEP Conversation Series at Odensea Business School. I'm Miruna Radulefevre, Professor of Entrepreneurship and holder of the Chair Family Entrepreneurship and Society. And I will be your host for the next four STEP Conversation Series, which throughout this year will take place in person in this studio. This is the TV Nantes studio, and we will broadcast live from Nantes, France. And today, I'm delighted to welcome our friends, colleagues, and co-authors, Jim Davis, Bühler Professor of Management, Head of Marketing and Management Department at Utah State University, as well, hi, Jim. Hi. <laughs> as well as Bill Gardner, the Bertarelli Foundation, <laughs> Distinguished <laughs> Professor of Family Entrepreneurship at Babson Colleagues. Hi, Bill. Hi. It's Great been, to be here. <laughs> it's been three years yeah. since we have you here at Odancia. Welcome. Thank Welcome you. again. Thank you. Welcome really glad again. to be here. <laughs> and so today's conversation will be about the construct of legacy in family business. And we will spend one hour together. And we will talk through a very recent study we've been conducted together, Jim, Bill, and I, on a systematic literature review on legacy in family business. In terms of timing, we will start with a short presentation of our research of about 20, 25 minutes. And then we will open up a 20 minute discussion and questions about our study with you which uh, follow us online on our YouTube, uh, YouTube channel, but also together with our invited participants, Natalia Vershinina, Professor Natalia Vershinina from Odensea Business School, and uh, Gideon Markman, Professor at Colorado State University. They will join us later. And we will end our session with a short publishing opportunities overview. These are call for papers, recent call for papers in family entrepreneurship and family business. And I hope you'll have a great time with us. Please don't hesitate to ask and uh, your questions and to send them on our YouTube channel. My colleague Raina Homei, uh, which is in, in the studio, will take them and send them to us. So now let's go for the part one of our today's STEP conversation series. So let's start with the presentation of our systematic literature review on legacy in family business. But before presenting our methodology and our theoretical framework, one question, one natural question comes up into my mind. Why legacy? Why do we study legacy? Why not focusing on other important challenging and issues in family business? So I will ask you, Bill, uh, Bill and Jim, what do you think about it? Why should we study legacy? That's a great question, Maruna. For me, successful transgenerational enterprise, what is the glue that holds the generations together? I, when I have worked in family businesses, I would often ask the business, so why are you doing it this way? Why do you believe these things? And many times they'll just look at me and say, well, it's always the way we've done it. It's always the way we've done it. Um, or sometimes they'll say, well, my great grandfather who started the company believed it. Um, or these are the, our family values. And I began to look at that and wonder what that was that, that was holding those generations together. I saw it. I wanted to know more about it. And then I do what scholars do. I looked at the literature. And wow, is it diverse. Uh, the legacy literature covers a lot of different, uh, 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 different themes, different usages. Uh, when you go to different uh, disciplines, whether it's sociology, psychology, they all refer to legacy. And they're just slightly different. Mm -hmm. And so it looked like an opportunity to, to ferret this out and come to a better understanding of what legacy is in family business. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. So how about your motivations for starting this study, Bill? Well, to me, the legacy is certainly in this framework of we realize that the past always informs the present. 
So then what is it about the past that really is carried on in what we do now? And, and I'll offer a story about my own experiences with that in terms of, I think, our challenges with trying to surface how a legacy goes forward. Um, I like to tell the story that uh, I come from a, um, generations of failed farmers, frankly, 400 years of failed farmers. And, you know, I can say that as a joke, but the issue was, you know, what does that mean? Well, um, uh, I'm sure everyone's following the geopolitical uh, concerns in Ukraine. Uh, Catherine the Great actually at one point had brought in a lot of Germans from the Strasbourg area. They were called the Volga Germans. Uh, my heritage comes from that area. So in the 1700s, they moved to Russia. They were there for a couple of hundred years. So again, you know, did they fail in Strasbourg and now they're in Russia and then they were in Russia for a while. And then given the geopolitical issues there, there was difficulty of staying in Russia and they moved either to Argentina or North Dakota. And then my, gener my, my heritage was in North Dakota, farmers there, and then there was the Dust Bowl, difficulties in making life happen there, and then they moved to Washington State. So there's always been this issue of this uh, pursuing opportunity through mobility. And if you look at my career, and if I think about what's the legacy that my, my generations have provided, it's always been that sensibility as if things get tough, we can always move on. Whereas, you know, I can look at a lot of people in the United States, people in Appalachia who say, you know, my heritage is my home, and I'm simply not going to move from that area. And that's simply not my, not my family legacy. All of my family has moved to better opportunities, but it's always about mobility. So, you know, to me, it's that wasn't really a conscious until we began to think about, so what is it that has brought me to who I am and why do I behave in certain ways? And these unconscious aspects are where I think we're trying to tap into what legacy is about. Many thanks, Bill, and thank you for sharing with us this personal story, which at the same time is, is a family and a collective story. And this also inspired us in thinking that, indeed, legacy is not only uh, a rational uh, event or process, but also comprises emotional, irrational, we may say, aspects related to identity. So. All these motivations actually brought us to the following research question. So we actually ask ourselves how the past influences present and the future. And based on this, well, this, this was the central question, based on this we actually engage with a systematic literature review and we collected all the papers which we were able to find in two databases. So this is our, our, our methodology. So we engage with a systematic search in two main databases in EBSCO and Web of Science, identifying all the articles, speaking about different keywords, and these keywords have been selected based on the fact that they were actually identified in dictionaries as synonyms of legacy. So we used notions such as heritage, hair, inheritance, but also other constructs used in the literature, such as imprinting or generations or intergenerational you know, aspects, in order to be sure that we identify all the articles speaking about legacy in a way or another, and this in a transdisciplinary way. Okay, And then we only selected those ABS papers uh, in, in published in ABS-based journals. And so we engage both in data collection and then data curation based on abstract and full text reading. And we came up, this is how we came up, with a final corpus of 123 papers, which we currently read and reread and analyze based on an analysis grid, which we collectively developed, but also based uh, on a new theoretical framework, which we will present you just now, if we can see the slide of the theoretical framework. So this theoretical uh, framework actually, you know, uh, presents five uh, main, main questions, which actually help us understand, you know, what legacy is, and also, of course, will help us map and analyze the field, and finally, formulate some future research directions. So, 
what we will do now, we will actually engage with each of these questions very shortly because we have only about 20 minutes, you know, to present these, these main issues. And then we'll discuss about them, of course, with Natalia and Gideon, who will join us in the studio in a few minutes. So let's go uh, with the framework and let's go starting with the first question. What is legacy, actually? The first, uh, the first uh, logical question regarding the nature of legacy. And when we ask ourselves what legacy is, how legacy is actually defined, characterized in the literature, we found different definitions. I will only focus on two definitions. So the first one was provided um, regarding entrepreneurial legacy by, by Jaskevit, uh, Combs and Rowe. And actually they defined legacy, entrepreneurial legacy, as the family's rhetorical reconstruction of past entrepreneurial achievements or resilience. Okay, so it's about stories actually we say about the past but is it only about stories is legacy only about these rhetorical reconstructions we believe not and actually in the literature there are additional different you know complementary uh, definitions of what legacy is and another very influential definition is the one provided by Hammond and his colleagues and they speak about legacy not only in terms of rhetorical reconstructions, but also uh, in terms of artifacts, what they call artifacts, and referring to biological, material, and social artifacts. But is it legacy about both immaterial and material artifacts? Well, we believe that, of course, this is, this is a theoretical discussion we will conduct here or we will start here. We believe that legacy is mainly immaterial and that material artifacts are vehicles of legacy, okay? So legacy is not something you can find on a bookshelf. These are vehicles of legacy carrying an immaterial uh, content, which is emotional, identity-related, fundamentally uh, emotional and identity-related. And I will let you, Jim, because you came up with, with this, with this uh, metaphor, uh, explain us more um, in depth what do you understand, you know, what, about what legacy is, because you came up with a very interesting metaphor. You spoke about uh, legacy um, as an invisible hand. What Correct. does it mean? Well, it's, it's this. Um, what we found in the literature can actually be described by biology um, and the human brain and how the human brain works. And um, if you could put up the image of the human yes. brain, there's, there's two parts to the brain. We've got the outer part that's called the neocortex. Mm -hmm. And the neocortex is language. It's um, analytic. Mm -hmm. it's, it's verbal. Um, it's that is the neocortex. And when we look at Hammond and Jakovitz and what they say about, uh, about legacy, it's the outer brain. It's the neocortex. In our analysis, we believe the place that, that legacy really resides is in the limbic area of the brain. It's the inner brain. And that's where values and beliefs, it's nonverbal. But that's where all human decision-making and behavior comes from. And very often when you, when you talk to somebody about why are you doing something, you have to almost unpack it and pull it out of that limbic area. The amazing thing is, is, is this. If it comes from that area and it's nonverbal, it guides your behavior, but legacy becomes an invisible hand. And where this comes from is Adam Smith. <laughs> Way back when, in, in 1776, um, he published a book called The Wealth of Nations. And in 1753, he published a different book. And, and that's where he described the invisible hand. And as what's amazing, he sees this, that invisible hand in the market, without any government intervention, the market will return to equilibrium. For us, as we've discussed, um, legacy in a family business, we believe that legacy is the invisible hand in the family business. It holds generations together. It's, it's values, it's identity, it's, um, it's belief systems, it's behavior. And when you ask them why they're doing it, they don't know. And it's like Bill's story until we sat down and unpacked that and he says, oh, 
it's my invisible hand. <laughs> so legacy is an invisible hand within the family business that holds that organization together through generations. Okay, so therefore there is, there is a discovery process actually leading individuals to discover, to self-discover their legacy That's correct. in a way. Um, and the, se the next question coming up into our mind regarding this theoretical framework is therefore why would an individual, a founder, a business owner want to leave a legacy? They, I don't know anybody. <laughs> Nobody wants to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. And they feel like they have knowledge, they have beliefs that, that are fundamental to the family and to the family business. And they feel like if they hand those down in some way, they imprint those, they make that the identity of the business and family, the future generation will have greater success. They want to define the family, and so they want to hand it down. But the important thing is it's not a legacy until the receiver receives it and interprets it, and mm -hmm. that's what legacy becomes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know, I know that actually we, we came up in, with, a, with a distinction um, between what we call intended legacy. This is the legacy intention at the sender that's level, right. and then the unintended legacy, what is left behind without actually the sender engaging you know voluntarily with this with what he or she sends and this is this is we think something very fruitful uh, for for future research but then the next question comes also uh, arises right now so what is actually a legacy made of uh, we want oh. to 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 be aware analytically about its content we know that hammond and his colleagues spoke about these artifacts so biological material and social artifacts but actually how how do we see things those artifacts are symbols mm -hmm. of the legacy but they aren't the legacy um, it's like so often you go into a church and you'll see something in the church. That church, that symbol is a reflection of where your faith should be. Mm -hmm. and, and it's the same with these artifacts. Mm -hmm. uh, your grandmother's house plant, um, a, a share of stock within the company, it's an artifact. It's not the legacy. Mm -hmm. The legacy takes place in that limbic area of the brain. It's a representation but the meaning we put on that is the legacy. Legacies are stories. Legacies are values and beliefs. They're memories. Um, it's internal. It's embedded. Um, and it has to be unpacked. It's that invisible hand. All the other things in the neocortex that are described by some of the other research, Hammond, for example, and Jackowitz, that's important. They're symbolic. And you mentioned intended and unintended. Exactly. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I may want to pass down this value, mm. but the future generation may look at that and say, oh, that's just nuts, and reject it. Mm. And it doesn't become a part of the legacy. It's how it's interpreted and what they adopt. That's the legacy. Yes, this is, I think this is one of the, the most important learnings from our analysis, the fact that Legacy is a co-constructed meaning, and it happens at the intersection of a sender and a receiver. No? So mm -hmm. the following two questions deal with these senders and these receivers. And I will uh, invite you, Bill, uh, to speak about who the sender is and then who the receiver is. And I think that was one of the big revelations of the study was mm -hmm. that if you look at how legacy has been conceptualized, it tends to look at the receiver only and says, at that point, what has been the legacy that they interpret as being where their reality is? Mm -hmm. And 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 I think w where we've gone is to basically say, well, no, invariably every generation communicates both intended and unintended legacies forward. So we've got to think about who those senders are and whether intended legacies actually can be transferred. And we're asking, how can that happen? Why does that happen? And then you know, it's like football. You can pass to the receiver, but then does the receiver actually catch the ball? So now is what is in that receiver's capabilities that allows them to basically take whatever that intended or intended legacy forward? So, 
you know, to me, that's, I think, one of the revelations of this study is we haven't really looked at senders and receivers as a part of the process and also realizing as we go through this transgenerational process, it's if you have three or four generations, each generation has to go through the process of passing on how that works. Mm -hmm. So, yes. you know, I'd, I'd say this is very exciting. We haven't really seen how that's played out in the literature, and I think the model has been really good about about offering, I think, a, a framework for people to understand <clears throat> all those characteristics. Yes, and it, this this also means that if there are, there is a sender and a receiver, and we approach them not in a linear fashion, but through a <laughs> social construction lens, mm -hmm. it also means that we may have perception distortions. So this is where meaning is actually co-constructed. So at the level of the receivers, we may have, of course, <coughs> therefore, benefits of legacy, as we always imagined, you know. It's good to leave a legacy, and it's good to receive a legacy. This may be, well, an implicit, you know, uh, assumption in, in our field. And, of course, it is in many cases. But this also means that receivers are also there to actually protect legacy. So they are guardians. But in some situations, legacy may constrain them. I agree. I think that's actually one of the challenges is that we can look at certain situations where the past constrains the present and the future in terms of what individual behaviors are. And we've certainly seen that in our uh, own anecdotal experiences, but certainly in the empirical literature where certain families, as they've moved forward, are bounded by what they can do given what the past is, their past legacy has both explicitly and implicitly implied them to, to act out. So. No, I don't think that we're implying here that every legacy is of great value and should be continued on. But I think that's the interesting challenges are kind of what are, now we can begin to ask, what are the beneficial legacies that families can pass on? And what are these negative constraints, particularly in terms of entrepreneurial capabilities? If I want my next generation to do and act in new things, and as the environment changes, what would that kind of legacy be, rather than a constraining legacy that keeps me in a past that I cannot kind of continue to, to live out into the future? In fact, I would also add there, you're right. It can constrain the strategy and entrepreneurship of the family firm. But there are times, I remember working with a family business in Jamaica, in Kingston, and uh, the children in that family, I talked to them, so are you going to come up in the family business? And, and they were older, they'd been college educated. I said, are you going to take over the family business? And they said, absolutely not. I don't want anything to do with that business. We saw what it did to dad and mom, and we don't want that. And so their the, is what they had imprinted with regard to the family business is negative. Mm -hmm. They want nothing to do with it. And now dad had a problem in succession. Where do, what do I do with the business now? Do I sell it? What do I do with the business when I, when I leave the business? Um, and so it's, it, it's, it's a legacy, but it's a negative legacy. Yes, exactly. So this also shows us that in terms of the what question, so the nature of legacy. We have this distinction between intended and unintended legacy. Yes. And then a second distinction between positive and negative legacies. And what is interesting, but also complexifies all the, all the thinking and then the measuring of this phenomenon, is that actually these dichotomies should be measured at both sides of the continuum. So because what is considered positive in the sender's eye may be considered uh, right. or perceived as negative on the receiver eye. And all this may change over time. So which is why we arrive now at um, almost our last question regarding processes. So how is legacy actually sent and received? And we know that some of these processes and mechanisms have been studied in the literature. Um, and I will, maybe the next slide, yeah? <laughs> Thank you. And I will, I will let you, Bill, send, tell a couple of, 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 of uh, ideas about these processes. Because we know that, you know, much of the literature focused, for instance, on sending legacy, you know, mechanisms such as storytelling. But how about receiving, you know, legacy? 
I think that's been a, b a big challenge. Well, but I would say in some ways we, we know a bit from the receivers because a lot of the research has been on individuals and how they've interpreted what the past has been. And as that slide says, you know, we've typically looked at aspects of storytelling, how they how they've been socialized into the process, and we've looked at some mechanisms about how families can, through stories, for example, g give individuals a sense of what they can do and where they can go. Um, but I think this has kind of been a big issue, is, is that we know, I think, very little about how families can better educate the next generation about what their legacies are, or at least surface them. So to, to me, the exciting part, actually, I, I think, to think about what senders do or don't do in relationship to how the receivers receive what that legacy might be. And then also, historically, to look at how those legacies are passed over over time and which stories tended to be actualized or not and why. Mm -hmm. So okay. a lot of, you know, for researchers, it's always exciting to have a framework where there's more work to do. We never <laughs> want to have all the answers. And I can tell you today, we don't have all the answers to no. legacy. No, we it's should. It's interesting as well that when you pass down a symbol, mm -hmm. an artifact, the business, mm -hmm. It may not be legacy at all. It mean it's not received as a legacy, yeah. and 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 that's another reason we're looking at legacy as that invisible hand, that internal, that internal thing. Yeah. But, and I would say too that you, you, what what intrigues me about this process is that you know coming from Babson, which is focusing on entrepreneurship and family entrepreneurship, to, to me the issue becomes how do you continue entrepreneurship across time where entrepreneurship invariably is doing new and different kinds of things, yeah. which means it may not be continuing the family business and the family business strategy. So what does entrepreneurship mean over time? And what would an entrepreneurial legacy be over time that might be different than just it, for here, really, it's the legacy is not pu pushing the building forward or continuing to do a particular kind of thing, but a, 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 a different kind of orientation. So ferreting that out in terms of where we're going our, with our research is, is to me really, really exciting. Yeah, yeah absolutely, so. absolutely. I totally agree, uh, Bill. I think studying this both constraining and enabling effects of legacy on entrepreneurs, on successors, is absolutely cru crucial. Is legacy finally an entrepreneurial resource, or is it rather a burden in terms of identity and skills. So, mm -hmm. okay, but I see, I, I, I see the timing. So I will now just end with the last question, which is the question about context, because of course, all these processes of sending, receiving legacy, co-constructing legacy take place into a context. And so culture matters, not only culture, but Time, space, place matters. And what we know, what we've seen in our text, in, our, in the papers we analyze, is that most of them are still um, about northern countries, you know, global north countries uh, research. And we know that focusing on different countries, emerging economies, developing countries, could bring such a richness to our understanding of what legacy is and the, how these processes, how this mechanism function elsewhere with other people within other communities. So thank you very much, Jim and Bill. Uh, we end here our presentation um, and we're now looking to your questions, so you can address your questions online on our YouTube channel. And I now will invite on stage Natalia Vershinina and Gideon Markman. So stay with us for the next 20 minutes of discussion on legacy in family business. Thank you. I'm happy, I'm happy to have here in our TV studio, Professor Natalia Vershinina, Professor of Entrepreneurship at Odensea Business School and Everyone. Associate Editor of Entrepreneurship and Regional Development, as well as Associate Editor of International Journal of Entrepreneurial Behavior and Research. Hi, Natalia. Thank you. What an exciting debate so far. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful to have you here. 
And hello also to Gideon Markman, Professor Markman, who just joined us from the United States. Um, he is our international affiliated faculty, professor of management at Colorado State University, editor of Academy of Management Perspectives, and associate editor of the Journal of Management Studies. Wonderful to have you <laughs> with us, Gideon. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank uh, you. Thank you. So, just one question before starting the deba debate. I'm sure that it will be a challenge out there in the studio to just follow us and follow the discussion. <laughs> but, well, just one question to you, Natalia and Gideon. So, after listening to this short presentation, so what are your feelings about? What are your ideas? How does it inspire it? <laughs> you it's in absolutely any way. <laughs> fascinating to, to have this perspective on legacy, which presents the socially constructed notion. And uh, although in my own research I look at uh, legacy issues, but I specifically look at maybe more material elements and artifacts, I think your discussion around the carriers was particularly inspiring and kind of produced several light bulb moments yes. in my head. And uh, I think this is a great avenue for future research. So definitely what you said was right, that this research captures specific areas uh, of what's already known and exists in uh, the literature and our practice, but also opens up so many different avenues. So the, the job is still, it's only the beginning. Exactly. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. What, uh, what do you think about all this? <laughs> but for me, watching from, from the sidelines, yeah. um, the, the challenge is really how to measure yes. exactly. something that we cannot see. Exactly. Yes. We exactly. cannot touch, yes. we cannot stop. Yes. It is there, we yeah. say. Everywhere. <laughs> but how do yes. we, how do we yes. really assess it if we yes. cannot mm -hmm. fully capture yeah. it, measure it? Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, and it's more than that. It's oftentimes, how can we measure something that we're not even aware of? Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the challenge as well as, you know, so much of it, in this, as Jim says, in the limbic system. So that's that's really the subconscious aspects of the nature of that process. And so how do we reach into the subconscious to make it conscious enough to even measure it? That's so right. that yeah. do we have to do psychoanalysis yeah. on every subject. <laughs> and how are we going to get through that for, through the research committee at the university? <laughs> yes, but to tell you, actually, to tell you a short story, Gideon, actually, this is how it started. Yes. We wanted to build, you know, um, a scale, a legacy scale. It was, you know, a modest <laughs> objective. Right. And then we gathered together, started thinking about this scale. And actually, we understood that first we must clarify what this construct is about, because we think we lack, we still lack construct um, clarity. So this is why we engage in this systematic literature review to understand what legacy is and then potentially, <laughs> to be able to assess mm -hmm. it. But you are right. And I think that actually the complexity of legacy is that it takes place at all levels. It takes place at the individual level, naturally, but it also takes place at the level of the family. So at the level of relations, intra-family relations, then at the level of the firm. And it takes place at the level of several families when we have multiple you know, family yeah. owners. And then it takes place within a culture, within a place, so at the societal society level, so where where do you where do you measure? You know where lo legacy is located, mm. and yeah, there are multiple legacies, <laughs> kinds but, of legacies, each of them influencing each other. So which increases yeah, I would also this add complexity? There that, that there's been a lot of fields of study that start by just studying the artifacts and assuming that represents yeah. the fine grained, mm -hmm. the harder data to get. For example, in corporate governance, we look at boards of directors and independents and assume that represents something. And then there's been Harrison and others that just like you said, eh, you got to peel back the onion. You got to get to the fine grained analysis to really understand what we think we're explaining. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where we're at here. Mm -hmm. The legacy literature has done a great job defining artifacts. Mm -hmm. And we feel like that's all it is, is a symbol of what really is the driver. Oh. And it's, it's a measurement challenge. So, yes. because you talked yes. about intergenerational. Yes. yes. So, the obvious question is, when does legacy, when is it born? When is it being born? <laughs> and, and, and does it not exist until there is a second generation? Yeah. Legacy is handed down. You can have generativity. You, yes. you intend to send something. Mm. 
you intend to develop legacy but what is accepted is a the legacy what how it is adopted how it becomes a part of the belief system and behavior that's when it becomes legacy i can intend it but until it's received and it may not be received as i intended yeah. that's when legacy bill do you agree well yeah but, mm -hmm. but i want to carry it out because then it plays out in the relationship to realizing so then legacy can be beyond kind of a family entrepreneurial legacy or even a family legacy and so businesses can have some kind of legacy orientation so yeah it gets into issues of imprinting but certainly does every founder have an intention for a business legacy that i don't know but they I mean, may that'd not. Be question. Do you think that every business, if you're a founder, you think about a legacy for your firm or not? Well, I'm, I'm still struggling with, with the parameterization of legacy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and where does legacy begin? That was the first question. Mm -hmm. When does legacy become and, culture? Yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Or tradition. Great or tradition. Question. Tradition, yes. And, and mm -hmm. what about Great the employees? Questions. You're saying... Yeah. Only the receipt. But what about employees receive some of that legacy as well, do they not? Yeah. Yes, sure. and they, they're a part of the equation. Yes. This is like, well, yeah, so you would have the yes. employees be a part of that as well. They should continue it on. And it could be possible to continue a, a family entrepreneurial legacy, or can you, without the family? And this is something we're working yes. on uh, very closely. So on, on, the, on the case study with Cadbury, mm. because Cadbury was a multi-generational family firm for very long until it became Cadbury Schweppes, a big conglomerate that then disassociated eventually itself from Schweppes, and then it got sold to Kraft. Mm. And the assumption is that it's gone through so many transformations that the Cadbury legacy has disappeared. But the reality is it's still there. It, st it still lives in the uh, eyes of the people, the people's experiences and the stories that they tell. The mm -hmm. artifacts and exactly. the emotion, the emotional the emotion. connection mm -hmm. hasn't gone. And I think mm -hmm. kind of to build this further, mm -hmm. it's not just about how a legacy gets born mm -hmm. and where it comes from. It's also how does it disappear? Yes. And what happens? And I want to bring one more example, mm -hmm. which is a short mm -hmm. example from Russia mm -hmm. uh, of a family firm that has recently, in the last year, and some of the people in the audience probably have seen this and know about this, mm -hmm. um, burned down. When factory, the big carrier of legacy, burned down, the legacy of the family and the firm mm -hmm. has also disappeared. So this is fascinating. Mm -hmm. We can see and we can observe the birth, the development, the growth, the expansion, mm -hmm. the positive, the negative. And I know that there are some comments in the, uh, from the audience on YouTube, mm -hmm. in, our, in, in our audience uh, from step members who are asking questions, what happens to the negative side, how, exactly. you know, they want to know more. So maybe yes. we can uh, kind of tackle uh, that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I would actually yeah. challenge the audience to watch the film House of Gucci, <laughs> where, where the <laughs> fundamental question of that film is, so what does it mean to be a Gucci? And does being a Gucci matter in order for the Gucci legacy to continue? Can you be it not a Gucci and still make Gucci work as a Gucci legacy? And what is the Gucci legacy? So to, to watch the film, see, see and then determine for yourself, you know, what is the legacy of Gucci and who is continuing it on? And I got to also, I'm going to mm -hmm. bring up a story as well. I work with a German company in Wedemark, Germany, Sennheiser. Mm -hmm. It's a third generation family business. You had the, what they call the professor. He was the founder. He's the one that came up with the original technology. And, and honestly, his son became, captured what he, he thought was important. And that became the legacy of the company. Now it goes down to the third generation. Uh, two boys <laughs> share the seat of CEO, Andreas and Daniel. And they're the co-CEOs now. They take from their father what they feel like is the essence, that, that legacy mm -hmm. that has been filtered through their father, now down to them, and now it's the legacy. They have a lot of non-family business, or a lot of non-family employees. It's shared to them as well. Now, I can tell you from Jay Barney's research, the successful, the core um, competitive advantage, the only sustainable advantage for that company is their culture and that legacy that has been, that's how they differ from any other firm. 
Mm. Without, that's the thing that can't be copied. It cannot be copied. Um, and that's been demonstrated in research. I'm wondering, does that require the family? <laughs> that is a great, great question. I, I, yeah, coming into family entrepreneurship a, a, as an outsider to, to the family part and more to the entrepreneurship part, I'm always intrigued with. So where does that kind of entrepreneurial great capability question. come from? Can it, can, can it happen vicariously through the learning of others? And so... I definitely want to say yes, <laughs> yeah. but I can't say yes because I don't no, know. No, <laughs> and I'm really intrigued, and I think this is certainly the challenge with families is can they continue family entrepreneurial capabilities in their family, or or can they transfer it to other individuals? But where where does that entrepreneurial capability lie within both the family and the firm as they move forward? So, um, so, so let me follow up on that because we, we just established that we, we don't exactly know yes. how to measure it. Yes. And, but then and, we're and, going to say that yes. that this is the source of competitive advantage. Yeah, you see? So well, we need to be It's careful. invisible it's, hand, baby. Exactly. It's invisible it's, hand. It's magic. Yeah. And I know that's yeah. a problem. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I think that this is what start, this study is about, actually. You know, raising questions, exactly. showing, showing, actually, you know, uh, things that we are, are hidden or we want them to stay there, you know, and, and just remain at the surface and measure what we can measure. Oh. And yeah, maybe we want to push, you know, all this. And actually, your question, you know, Gideon, it was about the boundary conditions. So what is fine? When it starts, when does it uh, end, how it circulates, and how is it different from culture, tradition, um, I don't know, inheritance and so yeah and these are the questions we are dealing in for mm -hmm. for with for a one year and I had we had you know some some just intuitions actually you know and what we said what we think what we feel is that legacy is something individual coming from an individual or from a family so some someone you can identify this is a major difference with tradition tradition is a society level phenomenon you can't know where a tradition comes normally you know in a culture so legacy comes from someone you can identify you can touch and then we were you know a little bit poetic about it and we said okay so maybe the the dream of legacy is to become tradition one day mm. You know, and this is when it can also become not only infuse, but really become an organizational culture. You know, but maybe this is the dream. A grown up tradition, a legacy is tradition. You know? yeah. <laughs> this, this is how legacy mutates maybe within in, in something else. And it starts with an individual. So this is the beginning. We need a sender. When you talk about mutation, yeah. because we were yes. watching yes. the yes. presentation, it was quite <laughs> yeah. riveting. And yeah. uh, we started this discussion. And, and we said, under what conditions, yes. when 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 the legacy becomes negative, yeah. right? Because we yes. tend to associate legacy with very positive yes. things, That's right. yes. driving even maybe competitive differentiation all the way to maybe even advantage. Yes. But what happens when the legacy is negative? Yeah, and and maybe also uh, uh, trying to understand why we all assumed. And we wanted to assume that legacy is systematically positive, you know, and I think that we assume it because, you know, in the succession literature, what we want, oh. what we are aiming for is intra-family succession. You know, this is the saint grail. OK, so in order to have intergenerational succession in the family, we assume that legacy is good. And it's even necessary is the ingredient is the a a DNA. So we have we need, you know, to transmit legacy further. And this is a good legacy because it's about the business and it will ensure competitiveness and continuity. But in fact, what we discover, and this is quite recent, when we study the receivers, you know, the next generation members, is how much suffering, how much ambivalence, yes. you know, how much emotional ambivalence we have there. And well, maybe now it's time to actually question this this positive overall positive assumptions about ne le legacy and try to understand where negativity is out there in terms of counter models you know or even values i, I want to make a few connections yeah. here mm -hmm. one is kind of the psychoanalytical thing that J mm -hmm. jim brought up you know there's kind of a jungian thing of saying um what we know is you know what's not processed consciously um often appears as fate and i think one of the issues of measurement actually is is that you know, if we could measure it or at least make it conscious, then it becomes less fateful. 
and then we can actually perform mm -hmm. some processes. And I think one of the aspects of academics is, you know, when I look at the family business literature is, you know, we've made conscious some ways that families act together. We've got the three circle model, for example, that <laughs> basically plays out a way of at least families thinking about where, what is my role as a family member or a member of the organization? What do I do? And I'm, I'm hoping in this aspect that while there's all this un unconsciousness that plays out in legacy, that it, we can make it more conscious actually through a measurement system. I mean, yeah. so that is yeah. that is the goal. But but I, I think we realized, yeah. we were hoping that that would happen in three months. Oh, <laughs> we would have a set of scales. We'd figure it out and then we'd be done and then we'd get that published and everyone would use the scale and that, that we're, we're simply not there yet. Yeah. We're not ready for, 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 for AMP. <laughs> Could I just are. jump in? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here. We're presenting the, the yeah, abstract we'll the where that goes. Yes, yes. Bring it on. Bring I, it on. I, Can I just jump in uh, and <laughs> reflect a little bit on this three-circle model? It's mm. quite interesting because mm. this three-circles model enables us to identify different roles that mm. people play. That's right. But maybe when we look at the negative side mm. of legacy, it's because there is no harmony between the legacies that each of those as individuals perceive, you know, as important to them, because le legacy is really about meaning to the person and what meaning people derive in relation to the position that they sit in within this three circle model is completely yeah. different. Mm -hmm. And maybe what we see as negative is not really negative. It's it's yeah. the fact that there is no unison and harmony. Yes, you you are right, Natalia. I think that um, negativity and positivity are. Uh, relational in mm -hmm. nature and here mm -hmm. we can see it mm -hmm. so strongly so what we mean by negative legacy can be a legacy which is constraining because legacy is also about freedom of yeah. course and this is how yeah. i came yes. <laughs> you know to, to legacy because legacy can constrain actually next generation's agency and mm -hmm. capacity to engage with their own future making here is where legacy can become negative not because it's negative per se but because its effects on per particular individuals in particular situations mm -hmm. are negative but and i see gideon but he wants to yeah the, um regarding the negativity we discussed briefly yeah. and you mentioned well maybe it's becoming a stigma at that point yeah. mm -hmm. um but as i was listening to many of your definitions or many of the positive uh attributes that are coming from legacy i thought you, you were missing one that I would like you to consider, which is uh, clarity. Mm -hmm. Even as parents, what is the, the, oh. be, the best gift we can give to our kids is clarity, right? Yeah. And, and when your legacy yes. brings clarity, the conditions change. Mm. But the legacy mm. can give you clarity about what to do in different conditions. And what not to do. And what not to do as well. I'd also, yes. Yes. I want to reinforce something <laughs> like you said, it. and I know yeah. we're running short on time, yeah. but <laughs> succession. Succession is a pivotal time mm. in which that negative, um, that, that bad legacy can be passed on. Mm -hmm. I worked with a company that had an 88-year-old CEO, father, who refused to let go of the business despite the fact that he had a, a very well-educated 70-year-old son who's been <laughs> waiting to take over forever. He's lived and worked in the company, and I went to the board of directors, and I kid you not, his father had a nurse and oxygen on this 80-year-old, and he refused to let go. Mm. That put a negative, mm. negative spin on that son because he saw his dad holding on. Mm. And, and I'll tell you, the behavior the attitude, the legacy, uh, what do you plan on doing when you take over? Changing everything. Um, yeah, clarity, yes. Burn it down. <laughs> yeah, and it was a succession moment. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Thank, no, thank you, Jim. Maybe maybe we ask uh, two questions. We have time to ask, um, to, to answer two questions uh, from, from the audience. Um, the first one, um, how does legacy connect with the idea of tacit knowledge? And I have the feeling that you, Jim, <laughs> you want to address this it's, one. Tacitness is mm -hmm. the only way to learn tacitness mm -hmm. is to experience it, right? Mm -hmm. And in a large, to a large extent, since we're talking about emotional development and that subconscious, mm -hmm. that too is developed tacitly. Mm -hmm. um, you, in, you can intend to develop legacy, 
and you intend to pass it down, mm -hmm. you do your best to pass it down, but in a lot of ways it's received tacitly. Yeah, exactly. uh, yeah, to me please. that brings up the issue of where that occurs. So, you know, we, we tend to say, well, and at least in a business school, well, then that, that, that should happen in the business. And that tacit knowledge will be, well, we'll bring the next generation in and they'll learn the business. But we forget the fact that, well, no, that business has already been learned at the family table growing up. Yeah. And that there's all of these other family dynamics, if we're talking about family entrepreneurship, where that's, that's yes. occurred. Yes. And, uh, you know, I don't think we, we, we appreciate how much is happening in those very, very young years in children's lives as they move forward um, in terms of their ability to kind of uh, have these family so legacies mm -hmm. occur. And I have one other question about legacy reconstruction over time. And it's, you know, it's connected to this idea of regenerating legacy or reconstructing legacy from someone working with family firms. Mm -hmm. And actually, they have this feeling that at some point, legacy should be reconstructed. Yes, if Natalia, I, I would please. love to kind of mm. start response to this question. So from the theoretical perspective, we talk about the idea of laminating. You know, so if we can imagine a metaphor of lamination processes and over generations we laminate certain values, practices, behaviors and uh, what we see is that as the lamination grows, mm -hmm. different people bring in different ideas. You have uh, people who are family members who have the power mm -hmm. to make the right decisions. They impose certain attitudes, behaviors. But you also include other people who are non-family members who are also an integrate part of the business that yes. also contribute. Yes. And yes. with time, mm -hmm. what we see is we see transitions and we see movements in yeah. the legacy. Mm -hmm. And certain things, as we talked, remain and endure so some of the messages get passed on, the stories get celebrated through That's generations. And I think this process of lamination is beautiful because it can be done through narrative. I like that. Yeah. And maybe a last, I, one you know, last if you question. Don't mind, please, uh, please. Uh, regarding the, previous, the prior question yes. about tacit knowledge, mm -hmm. that's what I was referring to when I was talking about clarity. Yeah. Yes. Right? Because to me, the legacy are like a set of principles mm. by which I'm going to act as a company, as a person, mm. and so on. So I think it it gives the knowledge without the knowledge being totally um, clear or it is still at a tacit level, mm -hmm. but it pops up should the conditions change. Mm -hmm. but, and, but this also suggests that actually we should develop self-awareness and ongoing self-awareness at the level of the founders and also at the level of the receivers. Because in order to bring about this clarity of mm -hmm. mind, you have to do an enormous work, you know, self-work in order to you know, uncover all this hidden, you know, uh, material in your own black box. Mm -hmm. You are acted, you know, you, you are acted by this unconscious irrational element, these emotions, identity related. And at some point you have to work on yourself through diaries. So maybe there are some self-discovery practices we yes. can bring into the, you know, upfront. And then these self-discovery practices will increase our self-awareness as senders of legacy in order to bring this class in our communication, in our behavior, this is so important because this is how we transmit legacy, not only through words, but mainly yes. through our doings. And yes, then we can ensure some clarity <laughs> at the <laughs> other, you know, on the other side of the, of the window. Yeah. And I think also um, legacy can be, uh, talking about the second generation, can be quite burdening, right? Yes. Yes, yes uh, absolutely right. Yes. So yes, yes. it is a burden. Yes. Uh, you are the mm -hmm. champion of your family's belief system. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a burden, and sometimes it's too big of a burden. Right. Yeah. But it so. might also, actually, might also explain why we have uh, issues in relation to uh, primogeniture, mm -hmm. as opposed to transitions or from yes. uh, male successor, from male uh, incumbent to a female yeah. successor, and because female legacy female. doesn't yeah. make sense. Absolutely. It, do, it's, it cannot be explained, it cannot be actualized. Mm -hmm. The experience is of a different gender. Mm -hmm. So bring in another very interesting <laughs> hook into this conversation. It brings in culture <laughs> again right. as well. Exactly. Right? Yes. Um, yes. 
Now, what is the difference between legacy and brand? It's, it's, Bill has an idea. <laughs> yeah, it's not only the sensibility. You know, I would look at brand as kind of a visible sensibility of what the, what, an articulation of who and what the company is about. But I think we're looking also more of how to behave and, and what to believe. So it's, it's more than just, just brand. There's something mm -hmm. simply behind it. Yeah. But but no, I think that's kind of the di the dilemma. Of what 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 does that really mean? I mean, is Gucci, for going back to the film, <laughs> you know, is Gucci? You know, I think I think everyone's got to kind of struggle with because I think that's actually the the nature of the film is what is the family's legacy and is it held biologically? Does it, does Gucci mean to be biologically Gucci? Can it be a way of acting like a Gucci? And what does acting like a Gucci mean? Or is it just the two G's interwined with red, green, and white. <laughs> is that Gucci? And can anyone can carry that on? So I'm not sure whether I, I, I we're struggling with it. I think that's the that's, yeah. that's, yeah. that's, that's the fun. Yes. That's the fun yes. of being the research, researchers in this. Is uh, is it, part that, of it is brand right? And that's mm -hmm. why you're holding those public conversations exactly. um, yes. because it, it, it's not until you start to unpack it, mm -hmm. discuss mm -hmm. it. it. And have you here. That's yeah. right. It's a struggle with <laughs> the you. Is that, that legacy might be the yeah. family's brand mm -hmm. and not the business's brand. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? Because yeah. I'll do business with that family. Oh, they have that business. Mm -hmm. Um, in certain cultures. In, in certain, certain cultures, cultures, I agree. Yeah. In certain yeah. contexts. Yeah. And I think that's an as aspect, too, is that there can be a, a business legacy and there can be a family legacy. And, and, and I'm intrigued with, um, you know, entrepreneurship can certainly be entrepreneurial through the business, but, but now the focus is really, for me and my chair, family entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm frankly not interested in the business legacy. I'm interested in can families continue some kind of entrepreneurial capability with or without the business? Yeah. So what does that mean? So families as teams, can we have team entrepreneurship as a family capability over time, this transgenerational time? <laughs> and the family le legacy is not the business. It's the no. behavior of launching ve new ventures. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've seen that in families. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, I don't want to work for your business. I'm going to start my own. <laughs> and and, and it's, it's expected of them. Yeah. And in some families, that's right. The family says, frankly, we don't even want you working in the business that we already have. You have to do something else. And that's actually the family value. That's it's right. what business you're going to start. Because exactly otherwise, right. you're not a part of the family. And this Unless is how you start our a business. meetings have gone. <laughs> exactly. And that's why I stayed yes. here. For two years, we are <laughs> two right. years. Okay, so I think it's time to pass. Many thanks to all of you. I think it's time to pass to our last part. So to the publishing opportunities. And yeah, let's see the slide and then. It was riveting. Okay, so just in a word, because we only have two minutes for this. There are four call for papers currently, you know, running in family entrepreneurship, family business. The first one is in entrepreneurship and regional development. Bill mm -hmm. <laughs> is here, so with his team of uh, guest editors. The topic is fiction and the entrepreneurial Im imagination. And you have time till June 1st. Send your ideas. And you can, of course, access all the call for papers on the journal's website. The next one is embracing the biosphere supporting humanity, a call to explore sustainable development in family entrepreneurship, also open in entrepreneurship and regional development, a team um, conducted by Marcela Ramirez Pacias. And here you have time till September 1st. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, few months. <laughs> um, the other one, very recent one, is in small business economics, about economic theories of the family business, concepts and evidence. Manuscript deadline is January 31st next year, James Krishman and his co uh, colleagues. And the last one, in the Journal of Business Ethics, about ethical issues in family business. The deadline is October this year, 31st October, with Elias Hagelias and his co uh, colleagues. And well, now this is where our step conversation series, our first co step conversation series held by Odensia ends today. Thank you for your participation, Natalia, Gideon, 
Jim and Bill. Thank you uh, to, to all the attendees uh, on our uh, online event. I'm more than happy and grateful for having you today to our discussion. And please let me also address my warmest thanks to some of those who helped us in this adventure. Raina Homei and Jean-Philippe Picara from Odensia Business School, Arpita Vias from the STEP Project, and of course, Eric Clinton. Hi, Eric. Hi, the, the Irish team <laughs> and his DCU team, uh, particularly Alan Drum, who no, no, not only set up this fabulous event format, but they also helped us throughout the process. They spent time with us explaining how this format actually functions in order to make uh, the best experience possible for all of us today. So I hope you'll join us to the next Step Conversation series. And I you, wish you a wonderful end of the week and weekend. Bye.